Great, sorry about that. It's probably better in the long term that I get that right uh, from, from the outset. Um, so uh, yes, um, this all started from a, what seemed like a simple question of uh, how to adapt uh, TV soundtracks for, um, for viewers with uh, different hearing losses. Um, and uh, I should maybe warn you right now that, that the structure of this talk today is uh, strongly resembles the flight of, of Icarus. Um, in that uh, from this launching point, uh, I'm going to head quite quickly into um, some higher level questions, which are higher than I can handle. Uh, so I will rapidly descend uh, back um, to, um, uh, to a sort of a, a specific application that uh, Robert and I are, are working on um, at the moment. But I will continue to descend from there uh, into much uh, sort of lower level um, uh, ideas um, uh, that I think are potential building blocks for, for future versions of, uh, of adapting TV soundtracks and potentially other applications as well. Um, so um, why TV soundtracks? Um, I guess one of the things that we can do to um, uh, hear TV soundtracks better is, is take off our hearing aid uh, and turn up the volume. And I think that is quite a common um, solution. Not the only solution, there's also Bluetooth um, uh, headphones, but uh, uh, Bluetooth um, hearing aids. Um, but hearing aids um, are you know amazingly designed to process sound in real time like in under seven milliseconds i'm not sure what they're doing these days uh, and they also have lots of amazing shortcuts so that they can so that the batteries can last for the entire day uh, when we're watching tv we don't need to make these shortcuts so you know can we do better what, what would be the, the the smoothest way to uh, to enhance the sound and i think this uh, question is also kind of interesting to tackle as a as a, someone from a psychoacoustical background uh, because tv audio is arguably um debatably uh, as complex as the real world it's got it's got your speech it's got your background noise it's got your music and ideally we'd like to hear um all of them you know uh, any attempts to sort of focus on the speech uh, has um typically not worked out so well in terms of your enjoyment um in the past um, but sort of unlike the real world, which our hearing aids are sort of designed for, um, TV soundtracks are, are carefully controlled. Like they, they arrive in two channels. Um, you know, it's worth spending time to massage these into something that we would uh, prefer to listen to. Uh, so we've kind of got this lovely little sort of crucible, this experimental crucible that um, that is kind of a, a mini representation of the real world, uh, but with sort of an applied outcome. And um, also. Um, I find that appealing because real time seems to be optional, uh, which may seem like a strange thing to say. Obviously, we'd like to just sort of sit down, watch TV, and have the um, the, the audio adapted for us in real time. Um, and for many circumstances, it will need to be that way. But there are also plenty of times when uh, we know well in advance what we're going to be watching. Over the next couple of months, I'll be uh, watching the final season of Nashville. Uh, and, you know, I know that now. So in principle, I could um, uh, start processing the audio now and get sort of a, a, a more individualized version of it. Um, I, and if this seems undesirable or only suitable for, for people with more techie um, instincts, um, you know, some of this could be taken, could be done server side. So large broadcasting companies already um, invest huge amounts into adapt into different versions of of their of their media um, for for different audiences. So I think there'd be a lot of um, willingness to do this if, if it could be done. So maybe some of the pre-processing could be done um, there. Um, I'm sort of slightly agnostic about how this ought to be implemented um, because there's other side benefits. Uh, I'd say of of, uh, of of tackling it in real time, uh, which is it kind of gets us around a bit of a roadblock. You know, when we're when we're focusing on hearing aids, there's so much pressure to approximate things for real time that um, that it's hard to sort of think of, of of other approaches. Whereas this kind of gives us the flexibility to consider more challenging things to process, and maybe if it works, if it turns out to be desirable, uh, we might be able to capture some of that for, for real-time processing. And at the very least, this is my sort of absolute backstop, um, if we can do, um, if we can enhance TV audio in, in the optimal way, in, in the best way we possibly can, uh, avoiding some of the issues of hearing aids, then we can, this gives us the chance to test how damaging some of the approximations and shortcuts of hearing aids are. Um, okay, so, uh, we've got all the computational time in the world now uh, by this sort of setup, um, and 
then stuck with the question of, okay, okay, what, what should we do uh, with all this computational time? Um, one starting point could be sort of some sort of signal-based metrics like uh, uh, the, the timbre toolbox. I guess my instinct would be to focus more on uh, perception because perception is what really matters. Like how much can we preserve uh, the typical perception of TV for somebody with, uh, with different hearing? Um, and that takes me into sort of like trickier terribly. How do we choose uh, what we're going to aim to preserve? Um, loudness, you know, seems like a rough approximation of what, what hearing aids currently do. Uh, we could hope to head into, uh, if, if we can get access to the individual elements of the mix, uh, we could hope to make some kind of corrections for uh, masking as well, which seems exciting. Uh, I did enjoy the abstract booklet. Um, uh, masking has a has a high likelihood at being inefficacious. Uh, nice, nice, nice phrase. Um, and um, I, I would also suggest that you know, especially when we've got computational time, we could we could consider ideas like enhancing pitch strength, for example. Uh, pitch seems, uh, and I'm not just saying that because I knew I was following Chris Plack, um, but uh, you know, it seems kind of fundamentally important to. Uh, not just music, but also speech perception and auditory scene analysis. Um, unfortunately, sort of when I went to look at this, uh, you know, we, to make this work, we need models of, you know, how we process pitch or masking or loudness, and we need these to work for real sounds, and we need these to be um, sort of parametric in terms of, of hearing losses. And uh, sort of even our best models sort of are more focused on on simplified signs, uh, and there aren't sort of I, I don't know. Uh, uh, Chris, please correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, for something like pitch strength, I, I sort of couldn't find uh, models that sort of could be thrown at complex broadband signs uh, that could be adapted for hearing loss. And sort of where do you stop? If you look at the list of all of the cues we might use for speech perception, you know, are we really going to try and preserve or enhance all of these individual cues? Um, so um, this got me thinking as to um, is there sort of a simpler, a simpler set of, of what I'm calling features um, that sort of we could aim to preserve or enhance. Um, and I really hope to have a sort of a principled way by which I could at least start to work towards an answer to this. Uh, but instead, here is um, sort of my, my starting point um, that um, it seems to me a, a no-brainer that we really need to sort of try and preserve um, temporal cues. Um, I, I think it may be surprising that I put this first and foremost, um, but uh, there are many sort of, especially the particularly uh, clever biological models uh, that, that we can use to manipulate sound. Um, the, the sound that they reconstruct tends to have sort of quite obvious distortions of, uh, you know, quite uh, like uh, not distortions, uh, artifacts associated with anything pitched. Uh, and I kind of worry that that would really interfere with uh, making sense of the auditory scene. Um, so I think we need to sort of maybe put that at the core. Um, of course, we need to maintain audibility. This is what hearing aids have been trying to do uh, for, for um, a half a century or more. Um, and I'm going to say sort of approximate loudness. I'm not married to getting loudness exactly matched across different listeners. Uh, but, you know, clearly we shouldn't be making quiet sounds extremely loud or, or, or vice versa. So um, if we're maintaining audibility, uh, we will hopefully get some uh, approximate loudness. Um, but I think what maybe is much more important um, is to preserve any any changes in loudness so uh, we if you think about music for example we don't want to be introducing obvious crescendos where uh, initially there had been a steady note uh, or, or vice versa uh, so so certainly some kind of contour seems to be much more salient than than any sort of absolute loudness um level um and specifically um i would suggest that we need to think about this in a frequency dependent manner uh, which will sort of become more uh, relevant in the in the next slide uh, so after all this uh, coming back down to earth uh, rapidly um I, I think what i seem to have done is is reinvented uh, dynamic range compression which is at the absolute sort of heart of what of what hearing aids um uh, typically try to do um and um, but I kind of 
you may agree or disagree. I, I, I think for myself, going through this process has made me sort of get a bit more clarity as to uh, what are some of the issues with the hearing aids that we might be able to avoid with a bit more computational time. Um, so some of the issues that that uh, hearing aids have uh, is that um, if you if you rapidly change the level, um, then we uh, you introduce uh, temporal and spectral distortion. So this is this is uh, the, the kind of thing you get with fast compression, uh, and you can avoid that by switching to slow compression. Um, uh, but that then sort of introduces these uh, unintended level changes as sounds sort of fade in or, 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 or fade out uh, in, in, in situations where we wouldn't really have wanted them to. Um, uh, other less obvious issues, uh, uh, what I'm calling side chaining, which is quite a sound engineering term, uh, is uh, across frequency, uh, is if you have a rapid increase in level at some part of the spectrum, this would often lead to changes in level at other parts of the spectrum. So this also introduces uh, subtle level changes. And essentially, um, we have a sort of rich history of different people liking faster or slower compression in different contexts, whether you're dealing with speech, or music, and I sort of worry that that a lot of this could be accounted for, uh, to, to more or less, um, in terms of you know with, of the artifacts that we are generating when we try to implement the dynamic range compression. So, um, people often ask me, "Are you going to focus on music or speech?" And I think broadly, I'm trying to focus on uh, minimizing these trade-offs, trying to sort of get the best of both worlds, so that so that there is less pressure to sort of to decide whether. Uh, to, to decide which problem you're more willing to stomach uh, in, in a certain listening situation. Um, so uh, I was quite sort of inspired there by uh, a model by Ray Medis. Uh, he set up uh, uh, some instantaneous uh, compression, which sort of you, was based on, on aud uh, auditory filters um, and um, was real time. So, you know, I obviously had to make some, some approximations. Uh, but what it did do really well, it, has, it ended up having very fast compression uh, while keeping these distortions very local in frequencies. So you don't get these sort of issues uh, across the spectrum. And it also had a uh, frequency resolution that is sort of uh, about right for, for, uh, for a, a typically hearing listener. Um, when I went to use it um, uh, for myself, I, I found it sort of um because of because of its its architecture it sort of had a fairly rippled um frequency response uh, and of course it had to react after the sign had already happened so so uh, you know it doesn't have to be that way for for our, our offline version um and i always worry that when you rip things into different frequency bands and put them back together afterwards it's really hard to make sense of what happens between these frequency bands so there's sort of a risk there of um uh, introducing other audio, audio artifacts so uh here is my uh, uh well, our, our attempt to um uh separate uh, sort of um separate sort of the analysis of deciding what we need to do uh down to the left hand side here from reconstructing the stimulus uh, so that we can sort of avoid several of these of these artifacts and hopefully get to a sort of a smoother reduced artifact uh, dynamic range compression um, and uh, so, yes, we like the Metis model. We've got our sort of analysis at a, at, at a, at, with a frequency resolution of the of a typical uh, uh, listener, a typical normal hearing listener. Um, and um, we can make our uh, because we've separated the sort of this from the reconstruction, uh, we can have a dense as dense a filter bank as we want uh, to minimize any frequency ripple. So we can almost eliminate uh, the, the spectral ripple by having an over dense uh, uh, filter bank. Um, and uh, I realize I'm sort of hiding some of the details in a black box here for out of interests of time. Um, but, uh, you know, this kind of then gives us an idea of, of what is going on there with the sound that and we can make decisions that are as complex as we like uh, about how we ought to adapt uh, the gain in a level dependent way. Uh, so we can anticipate, um, uh, we can we can look forward uh, and, and, and adapt the sound beforehand. Uh, we can 
uh, keep keep levels stable uh, over over a certain period. Uh, we can fade in, fade out uh, as we like, uh, but we can also make changes as fast as possible uh, while avoiding um, um, avoiding sort of uh, a too obvious uh, a spectral splatter. Um, so then uh, we sort of have uh, a sort of a very dense. Uh, smooth uh, specification of, of, of how we ought to change uh, our levels and we can then implement that in a sort of a separate uh, reconstruction um, phase um, and I, I've, we've, we've implemented this in what we're jokingly um, referring to as the, the slow Fourier transform um, uh, in that uh, if we just sort of add together all of the sine waves uh, that you would get sort of in, in a frequency domain representation, uh, we can then s gradually change the levels of these uh, over time and get sort of a very smooth time varying filter effectively uh, while avoiding phase and group delays, um, uh, cross band, um, uh, changes and sort of we can we've kind of got the maximum smoothness possible. Um, so uh, we are working we are working towards this. We, we have we have a version of this, uh, but uh, in terms of setting the parameters, we have some prelimin preliminary uh, experiments uh, to do. And uh, Robert has a poster on that, so if you haven't seen it already, uh, do pay um, Robert um, a, a visit. Um, and this kind of line of thinking sort of um, kind of makes me sort of worried about like, could we be doing more? You know, is, is, is this the best that we could do? And uh, compression has its, um, well, it's, it clearly has some limits. If we make changes too quickly, they, they cause artifacts. But where are, uh, where, you know, where are those limits? And, you know, if we're thinking, we can think of this in terms of pure tones. If you change the level of a pure tone quickly, uh, you know, the, the spectral splatter risks being quite, obvious uh, there's nothing hiding it uh, so you know we ought to sort of slow down our compression um, and uh, uh, but you know if for example we have a silence then there is no spectral splatter we can make our compression as fast as we like and there are sort of level dependent uh, compression algorithms uh, out there that we could make use of um, but, uh, but but then if we start to think about masking as well, if we have a broadband sound, well, the spectral splatter should be masked. So maybe we could go to back to faster compression again. If we have white noise, for example, we can change level as quickly as quickly as you like uh, with, with impunity. Um, so basically, this made me think that a lot of the tools that we are using to manipulate broadband audio are in some sense blind to the signals, to the signs that they are manipulating in a way that makes it really hard um, for us to work uh, with broadband signs. Um, you know, sort of all, all of these basic, uh, uh, you know, filtering, changing level, uh, cutting a sound, splicing a sound. The way we normally cope with this is uh, sort of our first option, just use them very cautiously, fade in and out very gradually, it'll all be fine. Uh, you know, make sure our filters aren't too sharp uh, and, and that won't do too much damage uh, to, to the signal. Um, but another, another approach to this could be that we spend a lot of time uh, really thinking this through and finding out what the limits of these are, because there is a cost to being over conservative. If you're over conservative, you're not um, having a smooth a compression, as uh, for example, uh, as, as you might want. Um, but sort of in the last minute or two, uh, I'm going to briefly introduce uh, what has been my, my my summer project of let's just change the tools that we're working with uh, to have something that we can control better. Um, and I'm heading towards um, phase vocoding, um, if you've come across it, uh, is sort of an attempt to rip even broadband sounds into pure tones, because we can work with pure tones much more easily. We can see where the artifacts would be uh, with them. We can see what might uh, mask what. Um, so, you know, if we could rip broad, broadband sounds into pure tones, uh, then there's a lot more that we could do with it. And in a sense, we can sort of see the... Um, uh, see, see the issues that we're creating uh, with, with, with the particular signals we're working with. So normally, um, phase vocoding works at a much higher frequency re resolution than the human auditory system. So it's kind of uh, any of its issues are kind of hard to interpret. Um, traditionally, any sort of transients, any quick changes uh, uh, cause trouble for the system. So they're sort of siphoned off uh, in, into a separate problem. Um, and um, so I wondered, OK, can we do phase recording at the frequency resolution of the auditory system? Because then at least um, 
uh, you know, even when we're working with something as dense as, as a white noise, the, the, the pure tones that we get out of it have some relevance for the cochlea. Um, I'll maybe I'll maybe skip this, uh, except to say that that even when dealing with something as as dense as a white noise, uh, from our from the point of view of our, of our auditory system, um, our uh, our cochlea, if we were to ask it, uh, you know, in terms of its temporal cues, um, you know, it's, there, there, there's definitely regions of it that seem to largely agree about what sort of the dominant frequency is at any moment in time. So there is some kind of uh, hope that this could work. Um, so I, I kind of followed some of the phase for coding um, uh, tricks, uh, which I won't go into now, just to try and extract frequencies this time from an auditory filter bank. Uh, unlike the original phase of recording, but then sort of collating it into simplified strands. So uh, if I take a white noise, for example, um, in this sort of rather approximate system, uh, I was able to extract these little squiggles, which I'm referring to as, as strands. So it's as if a pure tone starts here, rapidly changes, and then sort of dies out at some later stage. We can no, no longer track it. Um, and um, we can then just sort of test, we can reconstruct from these individual pure tone strands. If we add them all together again, we get back to what sounds like uh, a white noise. Um, uh, the original white noise was this. Um, but more importantly, for those of us who care about noise perception, uh, uh, that's another story, um, is that we've, all, we've even managed to reconstruct a lot of the little details. If you sort of, if you zoom into one little area of, of this um, spectrogram here, you can see there's a little shape. Uh, for what it's worth in it uh, that I've managed to recreate uh, identically enough. Uh, there's a correlation of 0 0.89, which I think sounds better than it is uh, in reality, uh, but you know we're kind of getting back near enough to our signal despite lots, lots of approximations and errors in here. Just to give you a, a speech uh, example, this is me saying uh, test in my house. Test. Um, and uh, we can rip it apart and you can sort of see, maybe it gives a clearer idea of what phase recording does, we can see that our resolved harmonics are, uh, are preserved in here and sort of drift off into unresolved ones. Uh, and uh, this diagram doesn't sort of indicate levels, so you can see there was a background noise in my house, unsurprisingly. And I think these lines here are because a couple of doors away uh, my washing machine was running uh, at the time. Uh, so we sort of see different things in this kind of representation. And we can get back to the original speech, uh, despite having ripped it apart into pure tones and put it back together uh, with a correlation of uh, R equals uh, 0.98 um, between the original and the reconstruction. And again, um, these are th these R values always sound better than they are in reality. Uh, I'll play you uh, the reconstruction. If you listen very carefully, um, uh, you may be able to hear some of the artifacts that I haven't yet fixed. Test, test, test. You may have to take my word for it. There are little clicking noises uh, for reasons that I, uh, I, I partly um, understand. And I do believe that um, unlike uh, sort of previous phase of recording messages, there, there is a route to uh, a nearly perfect uh, reconstruction through this. Um, I'll maybe save that debate for um, uh, another time, but that's sort of what I'm working towards. So just a quick recap. It maybe makes more sense of my slightly pretentious title here uh, that um, uh, I think what I'm trying to do is get away from sort of, you know, thinking what signal processing tools do we have that could enhance sound and getting more to the question of what features, what perceptual features do we really want to preserve, which are we trying to even enhance uh, and let's do that. But I think this has to be done in a spirit of trying to avoid the collateral damage to other cues. Um, that we, we maybe aren't targeting with our signal processing methods. Um, I, I think sometimes when we have in the past tried to enhance pitch strength, for example, we introduce artifacts that are way less desirable than, than, than any benefit we might have hoped to have. Uh, and I think we just need to spend the time uh, doing the signal processing to, uh, uh, with, with a bit more precision uh, to sort of be more aware of what these trade, uh, to try and minimize these, these trade-offs to see what we could do uh, in principle. So I guess the centerpiece here is we are working on uh, some reduced artifact, artifact dynamic range compression, but in the longer term, uh, I'm hoping that this vector-based audio uh, could be a way that we can start to manipulate some of the finer cues of real-world broadband sounds uh, with as much control as we had when we were doing psychoacoustics with, with pure tones. 
Uh, and uh, I think this could also be maybe one of the one of the tools that could springboard us um, into um, manipulating audio in a much more controlled fashion uh, rather than using some rather blunt uh, signal processing tools. I'm sorry that was so fast, uh, but uh, yes, any questions?